Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.8.4.1, Recombinant DNA Technology from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. We should know that recombinant DNA technology involves the transfer of fragments of DNA from one organism or species to another. We should know that since the genetic code is universal, as are transcription and translation mechanisms, the transferred DNA can be translated within cells of the recipient transgenic organism. Then we need to know the different ways in which DNA fragments can be produced, as well as how fragments of DNA can be amplified by in vitro and in vivo techniques. We should know the principles of the polymerase chain reaction, also known as PCR, and how it amplifies DNA fragments in vitro. We will also cover how DNA fragments can be amplified in vivo using a culture of transformed host cells. This involves a few steps, including the addition of promoter and terminator regions to the fragments of DNA, the use of restriction endonucleases and ligases to insert fragments of DNA into vectors, transformation of host cells using these vectors, as well as the use of marker genes to detect genetically modified cells or organisms. So let's make a start. Recombinant DNA technology involves the transfer of fragments of DNA from one organism or species to another. Note that, because the genetic code is universal, as well as transcription and translation mechanisms, the transfer DNA can be translated within cells of the recipient, i.e. transgenic, organism. There are three ways of producing DNA fragments, one of which is to use a reverse transcriptase enzyme. mRNA for a specific polypeptide is isolated from a cell. It is then mixed with free DNA nucleotides and reverse transcriptase. The reverse transcriptase then uses the mRNA as a template to produce cDNA, complementary DNA, which is a double-stranded copy of the required gene. Note that using mRNA is useful, as most cells only have two copies of each gene, whereas they have lots of mRNA of that gene. The mRNA is therefore readily available and easier to obtain. Also, mature mRNA has no introns. Another way to produce DNA fragments is to use restriction endonuclease enzymes. These break phosphodiester bonds between DNA bases and bind to recognition sites. The active site of the enzyme is complementary to a specific recognition site on the DNA. The restriction endonuclease binds to the recognition site and cuts the DNA. Note that you need to form two cuts at either side of the gene. Most restriction endonucleases form what is known as sticky ends, which are staggered cuts revealing unpaired base sequences at either end of the fragment or plasmid. Note that the plasmid is known as a vector, which is used to transfer DNA into a cell. Vectors may be plasmids or bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. If the vector DNA is cut open using the same restriction endonuclease, then the sticky ends of the vector will be complementary to those of the DNA fragments. Sticky ends of the vector and DNA fragment are then joined together by a DNA ligase enzyme, which catalyzes the formation of phosphodiester bonds between bases at either end of the fragment. Note that using restriction enzymes is less useful, as they may cut DNA with introns too. Finally, we could also use a gene machine to produce DNA fragments. First, we determine the amino acid sequence of a specific polypeptide that we want to produce. This tells us the mRNA base sequence from which we can determine the DNA base sequence which acted as a template for it. The gene machine then assembles and joins together nucleotides in the desired sequence. Once you've isolated your DNA fragment, you need to amplify it so you have sufficient copies to work with. There are two ways to do this, in vivo or in vitro. So let's start with in vivo. As previously mentioned, the vector DNA and DNA fragments are combined to produce recombinant DNA. We need to add specific promoter and terminator regions if necessary, and I'll cover what these are specifically in just a moment. The first step in in vivo cloning is transformation, which involves insertion of the recombinant DNA into a host cell. If a plasmid is the vector, host cells can be stimulated to take in the plasmid. If a bacteriophage is the vector, the bacteriophage injects its DNA into the bacterium. Then we have identification. Only very few host cells will take up the recombinant DNA. In order to identify which have taken up the DNA, we use marker genes which are inserted into the vector together with the required gene. Marker genes may do two things. First, they may code for antibiotic resistance. The bacteria can be grown on an agar plate containing the antibiotic, and so only transformed cells, i.e. cells which have taken in the recombinant DNA, will survive and produce colonies. Marker genes also may code for fluorescence. The cells which have taken in the recombinant DNA can then be identified using UV light. Finally, the transformed bacteria are allowed to reproduce. 
This is an example of in vivo cloning. Note that you must ensure promoter and terminator regions, which determine where DNA polymerase starts and stops replication, are present in the recombinant DNA. They are specific to the gene. These regions may already be present in the vector DNA, or they may have to be added to the DNA fragments. Finally, we have in vitro amplification, for which we use the polymerase chain reaction PCR method. Why would we use PCR? Well, we could use it to test for the presence of a specific DNA base sequence, for example, to test for viral infections. We could use it for genetic fingerprinting, which we'll cover later on in the specification, or we could use it for genetic modification to transform organisms. So how does PCR work? First, a reaction mixture is set up containing the DNA fragment to be copied, primers, DNA polymerase, and free DNA nucleotides. Note that a primer is a short, single-stranded DNA base sequence that is complementary to the bases at the start of the desired DNA fragment. It allows DNA polymerase to bind to the start of the DNA fragment. Note also that the DNA polymerase is a special heat-resistant type. As for PCR, we need high temperatures, so we use TAC polymerase, a type of DNA polymerase that is obtained from thermophilic bacteria, and so is heat-resistant. The next step in PCR is to heat to 95 degrees Celsius so that DNA denatures, meaning that hydrogen bonds between strands break. Then we cool the mixture to 50 to 60 degrees, allowing primers to anneal, i.e. bind, to complementary bases at the ends of fragments. Finally, we heat to 72 degrees so that DNA polymerase can carry out extension of the strands, meaning that new complementary strands are formed. We repeat this process many times. Great, that would be recombinant DNA technology covered. We have covered how recombinant DNA technology involves the transfer of fragments of DNA from one organism or species to another. We now also know that, since the genetic code is universal, as are transcription and translation mechanisms, the transferred DNA can be translated within the cells of the recipient, i.e. transgenic organism. We have covered the different ways in which DNA fragments can be produced, as well as how fragments of DNA can be amplified by in vitro and in vivo techniques. We have also covered the principles of PCR and how it amplifies DNA fragments in vitro. We have also covered how DNA fragments can be amplified in vivo using a culture of transformed host cells. That would be it for now guys. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment. Next time we will be covering how differences in DNA between individuals of the same species can be exploited for identification and diagnosis of heritable conditions.